today is uh, really came about pretty randomly. Um, a friend of mine, um, Project Unity, who we've had on here um, not too long ago now, maybe a couple of weeks, we had a great talk. And um, he had posted something with uh, Mr. Ramirez. And, you know, I saw him do a video uh, like months ago. And it, I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that was that was pretty cool. So I just got in touch with him and asked him to to talk with me. And he was very responsive. And we set something up right away. And it's fantastic. Then I watched his thing with uh, Whitley. Uh, which I put in the description there, so you can check that out. Um, I don't like to cover the same stuff usually, but we'll see how it goes. Um, you know, I was informed I can ask anything. He's not going to answer everything, but I can, <laughs> but I can ask everything. Um, and so when we get through with our stuff, you know, and doing our thing, if we have time, um, you know, you guys can ask questions too. And it's, uh, I would assume it's the same policy. You can ask anything, but he can't answer. Uh, everything in him if that's the case you know he'll just politely let us know so um yeah with that being said i won't waste any more of your time i will bring on mr john ramirez how are you pretty good thank you for having me yeah good thanks for coming on i really appreciate you taking the time so um how was your day thus far uh, in Arizona, every day is a wonderful day, and we have um, a monsoon season over the uh, summer where we get most of our rainfall, so it's like a torrential rainfall, highly localized. Literally, you can have several blocks uh, inundated with rain, and then uh, a few blocks away, it'll be like sunshine. And so we're done with that, and now we're uh, in a period where uh, the temperatures are uh, very comfortable, 70s, 70s to 80s all throughout the summer. Yeah. And that's when the uh, snowbirds from where you're at, <laughs> red <laughs> snowbirds, they all come down. And so uh, most of my neighbors uh, here are snowbirds from the north. And okay. so we're hoping to see our neighbors pretty soon come down, uh, probably around November. Yeah, I'm very used to the term snowbirds being from here and, you know, doing business here. I get a lot of that. I can't get a hold of people because they're snowbirds, so on and so forth. <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, you were nice enough to share with me your credentials. Um, just quite amazing career that you've had, to be honest. Uh, you started in the CIA the year I was born, 1984. Um, and you've done everything from doctorate of uh, intelligence, uh, senior analyst, science and technology, IT manager, um, the United States Navy, um, which was a very uh, interesting background there. Um, so, you know, I guess I'll start out with the first question. Um, what made you want to go down this path? When did UFOs uh, tickle your fancy, so to speak? Um, everything started when I was very small. And you've heard this story before that uh, yeah. people who are interested in this had experiences uh, around about age four, five or six. And that's the same with me. I've had experiences wow. and I've described those uh prior, but uh, basically yeah. just to condense it for you, um, I remember being taken by a woman to a house that uh, was like a Victorian house and the woman wasn't my mother and being examined by a doctor and a nurse who looked to be like Victorian doctors and nurses and wow. reassuring me that, um, that no harm will come to me, everything is fine, we just want to examine you and being undressed and being examined, being dressed again and I would be let out to the house Sometimes it's on the first floor to the left and sometimes up the staircase and to the left again. And um, another experience I had was I was at a, um, what used to be called, and I'm going to date myself because I was born in 53, what used to be called a five and dime store where um, now they're called dollar stores, but you know, nothing's really right. a dollar <laughs> at these stores, but yeah. they were called five and dime stores. And it was a, a, a bin of books. And I was just thumbing through the books because I love books. And um, I saw a book with uh, an illustration on the lower left-hand corner, and I still remember it. And the illustration showed uh, two uh, primitive humans, like uh, I would guess you call cave people. And the woman had her arms outstretched, and in her arm was a more modern-looking, like a, a baby. 
um, not, not a primitive baby, but a, a modern baby in her outstretched arms and a beam of light shining down from uh, a saucer accompanied by another saucer. Wow. And the download I got from that was, this is where you came from and that uh, we made you. Um, this is where all humans came from. And so that was a fascinating thing for me. I wanted to take this book home. So I got yeah. my mother elsewhere in the store, br brought her back to where I put the book down, and that book was not there to be found. And this is just two of the early experiences, and I've had these experiences all throughout my life. Wow. That is incredible that, uh, you know, a man with such a, a resume, you know, has had an experience like that. And I don't think uh, often we're, we're privy to, um, to that and, and people like that. So I really do appreciate your courage for coming out and, you know, talking about that, starting off with woo right away. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good point that you brought up, Sean, because um, a lot of my uh, close personal friends at CIA and elsewhere in the intelligence community, uh, once I got to know them and uh, establish a trust relationship with them as colleagues, uh, they've all shared similar experiences. Um, and so it's it's prevalent uh, everywhere. You don't have to be in an intelligence community to have this experience. No, I'm, I'm sure many of your uh, viewers today have had similar experiences. Uh, yeah. The question I have is why us? Now, some people say, no, I ne this never happened to me. I think it's all hogwash, you know. Right. But for those who have experiences with seeing craft or seeing orbs, with having visitors come to our um, residence, Usually at night. I don't know why they like bedrooms. <laughs> they usually appear in bedrooms. And they need to be comfortable. Uh, intelligence community personnel tell me that you know they had similar experiences um, with visitors in their bedroom. Well, um, now it's going to be hard to change topics from that because it's so very interesting. But I did want to. My plan was to kind of end to that and kind of uh, you know start with. Um, you know, all your knowledge. So by the end of it, it would be that much more difficult for anyone to doubt you. <laughs> so, um, you know, some of this, uh, some of this, you know, I'll start with, and it's just kind of selfish stuff because I've, you know, been researching this era, but I'll make it really quick. Um, you know, I pretty much gotten all the way up to the Condon report and the University of Colorado study. And you might not know the answers to these things, but uh, you're a lot smarter than I am. So I have to at least ask. Um, now, the only thing I found, which I shared recently on my Twitter page after uh, that study, was SRI International um, proposing a UFO research program. But I don't know if that happened or what happened. So long story short, what happened in the huge gap between Colorado and OSAP? <laughs> a lot has happened. Um, and um, I should say that uh, the Condon Report um, and the Robertson panel, uh, there's the two um, semi-quasi government sponsored uh, studies into uh, UFOs. Mm -hmm. um, they were primarily hosted by an office in CIA called the Office of Scientific Intelligence, or OSI. Right. And uh, within that um, organization, um, the OSI was looking at everything from a science and technology perspective, not necessarily a uh, threat, like an adversarial threat, right. uh, but like what is happening in our skies and why. Um, after these studies were conducted, um, the Department of Defense more or less took over from there. And that's where you hear about Project Blue Book. And that took it away from CIA, which uh, in the intelligence world, uh, okay. we have a different set of laws governing what we do for the US government. And mm -hmm. it's gonna get into a little bit of policy wonkiness but it's important to distinguish what the Department of Defense does in the ufology field and what the CIA can do in the ufology field. And so we are called a Title 50 intelligence agency, a civilian intelligence agency. We're not beholden to the Department of Defense in any way. Our analysis is not geared toward uh, discovering whether something is a threat or not. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we just report on the science and technology aspects of what we collect. And it's not necessarily UFOs, but it could be like the Russian nuclear program or Iran right. nuclear program. It's all about the science and technology. We don't make assessments as to whether this program is a threat. So from the UFOs perspective, uh, we didn't even cover that threat aspect. We tossed it over or it was taken from us by the Department of Defense and under Title 10, which governs the Department of Defense, it's all about national security threats. And that's what drives defense acquisitions. Um, and so from UFO perspective, you know, are, are uh, the craft we're seeing pose a threat to the uh, national security of the United States in the uh, framework of our, do we have control of our own skies? Right. So that's what happened all through um, Project Blue Book. And um, that's the distinction between the two. Now, after Project Blue Book was done, uh, that's where we learned that um, there was NITS. And that's also right. kind of like not entirely government sponsored, but I believe that the government had knowledge of NITS and what they were doing. Um, and so NITS took it up to a certain point, And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, 1992, might be when NITS stopped. So what happened after NITS stopped and um, ALSAP started, uh, what was that, 2008, I believe. Yeah. Funding and all that was arranged in 2007, 2008. So what happened in between? Well, there was an advance in sensor technology that we didn't have before. Uh, it's no longer a secret that the National Reconnaissance Office, or NRO, uh, collects, uh, builds satellites to collect imagery intelligence. And we know that because, you know, we have Google Earth now. Right. And we have Google Maps and all of these uh, civilian type of um, ways to access imagery intelligence. Well, they built these satellites just to take pictures originally. And there's a whole series starting from like a KH-1 Corona program all the way up to what you know. Yeah, is tag board and all that. Mm -hmm. and so you know all of that. Um, now, the, the what happened was in the 90s, a special payload was placed um, because there was space on the spacecraft. And when I say spacecraft, I'm not talking about UFOs. That's right. the way we talk about satellites. And sure. so I'm going to use a lot of like acronyms and stop me if you want me to explain one, but spacecraft okay. meaning satellites, there was payload space. So the initial payload, the primary payload is to take pictures. And we got all this space on the spacecraft. What else can we do? And that's when they start putting what we know as MASIN or measurement and signature intelligence sensors, mm -hmm. IR. And right. IR is that uh, band of um, uh, wavelengths below red. And it's, so they're long wavelengths below red. They're above the radio frequency wavelengths and below the light spectrum. So in that, they were sensors placed. And originally, um, there were very primitive sensors. You basically saw something that lights up, and there it was. Mm -hmm. so it was designed for like launch detection. You know, okay. if a country fires a ballistic missile, we see it, it lights up. Yeah, there was a ballistic missile fired, or there was a nuclear test, it lights up, and we can see it. As the technology progressed, we went from a simple sensor into something called multispectral. And in an intelligence world, multispectral means we have four bands of IR now on board the spacecraft, four bands. And we also had the defense support program satellites who were like mostly geared for launch detection and nuclear detonation detection. So we have these assets up in space. And that's when they start seeing like, oh my gosh, look, there's all these orbs up there. And by the way, they're not like <laughs> craft. They're not metallic craft flying in our skies. There are orbs of light. What is that all about? Um, and there's, and so it's not just like um, a, a random occurrence. I mean, it was happening so that it appeared the orbs of light were flying in formation under intelligent control, meaning that wow. it was flying with intent to go to a destination and with a purpose in mind. And so there we, we have a situation where Okay, what kind of technology is that? And so um, we started studying these orbs of light. So we knew this before all SAC was created. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Did was all right before that? Um, 
and you might not be able to answer this one. Is it true that there were about 50 orbs or so picked up by satellite? I don't know the number. I have okay. not seen an exact number. Um, that's something that if you ever get uh, Dr. James uh, Lekaski on your program, yeah. <laughs> that would be a good one to ask. <laughs> okay. But I know there were several. Yeah. Um, and so that started um, a uh, working group to form in the intelligence community. And a timeline, let's advance it to like late 90s, early 2000s. Sure. The working group was established to look at this, and it was a small working group. Now, of course, I mean, what was the United States' major concern in, in the early 2000s? It was counterterrorism. Yeah. So all the efforts went toward counterterrorism, taking money from everywhere else. Uh, so there was a small working group. And but as more of these collections occurred, um, it was obvious that more need, needed to be done. And that's where uh, I understood um, the CIA's participation came in. And I have to be very careful here because I can talk about it from a general sense, but not get into specifics. Um, as you know, let me preface it that I did do a 74 uh, slide presentation. The purpose of it was to, or well, first of all, I, I was hoping to present this in a uh, con in the context of a, a UFO uh, convention uh, symposium on stage. Sure. But secondly, and most importantly, I wanted to put down everything I knew on paper in a PowerPoint format presented to CIA to see what got redacted. So my several slides about what I'm about to tell you never got redacted. Um, I titled it, uh, what would the, the uh, intelligence community do if they saw a UAP phenomenon event? So here it goes. So the first thing we would do is we would like Occam's razor, you know, let's find like simplest explanations, the most mm -hmm. likely. Um, let's look at, for example, could this be a, an aircraft or some craft uh, flown by China or Russia? So we, we looked at that inventory. And so we eliminated China. But in Russia, there was an interesting uh, uh, analysis done on one craft that they had, the MiG-31. The MiG-31 can fly up to 123,000 feet. That is the okay. highest that an air-breathing craft can fly, and they still hold that record. You might hear the SR-71 went above it, but I can't confirm that. The MiG-31 yeah. went above 120,000 feet to 123,000 feet, and it had the capability of operating in a combat mode uh, from 85 to 100,000 feet. Wow. And so it carried something called a plasma stealth generator as a countermeasure uh, to uh, ward off radar signals. Now, what we did was to use faceted aircraft. And we did the math, ironically, came from the Russians. So we discovered that the Russians were working on uh, a faceted aircraft design which they never executed because they went much more higher in technology by creating plasma stealth, which you can put on any aircraft. And okay. so we eliminated the MiG-31. Uh, it couldn't have been the MiG-31 because we know when the MiG-31 flies. So we looked at all of the um, analysis for the MiG-31 in flight and none of them match were the uh, sightings of the orbs. The MiG-31s were not flying, especially um, when the orbs are flying in space above 123,000 feet, we knew, okay, that's right. not 31. Right. Uh, so we eliminated that. And then, so the uh, orbs are, or anything up in space, from space to the ground or in space, uh, that is the responsibility of not CIA, DIA, or NSA, or NRO. NRO builds the satellites to do it, but the uh, NGO. NGA. National NGA. Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA. I was amused in the uh, uh, skin workers of the Pentagon book that Lekaski actually called it NGIA, and that's a mistake. <laughs> it's NGA, <laughs> it the letter agency. Um, okay. They uh, were the owners of that data, of the orb data. Wow. And so as owners of the data, they needed to find out if it's not an aircraft, what could it be? 
The first thing you would look, the first place you would look is to eliminate that there were glitches in the software, the imagery analysis software. Right. Tool. And so could, could it be like a glitch there? Uh, what happened? Why are these orbs being seen? And they totally like ruled out that it's software. So all of the imagery analysis software was working as was intended. Secondly, uh, the next place you go uh, from the NGA perspective is to ask NRO, since NRO is responsible for the care and feeding of our uh, overhead constellation, um, was there anything wrong with the satellites? Could you check the satellites? Are they working? So NGA checked the satellites and said, yep, they're working. So if it's not the software on the ground or the hardware up in space, uh, we, we have an interesting situation. There's something there because it's not an adversary. <laughs> I'd like to see everyone's face at that point. And well, what happened was <laughs> the NGA and NRO together uh, established a working group. And it's not true that to do anything in the government, you need money. This is part of the everyday job that we have is to make sure that our collection systems are operating as normal. And that's already pre-funded. That's already in the, uh, the intelligence budget for both the uh, Title 10 military side and the Title 50 civilian side. Oh. So as a matter of course, you can just call a working group together. And so they sent out the working group invitations to subject matter experts in every intelligence agency. So at CIA, there was a subject matter expert that they went to. Uh, and this sub subject matter expert, uh, and remember I mentioned Office of Scientific Intelligence? I do. That office merged with the Office of Weapons Intelligence and created something called the Office of Science, Scientific and Weapons Research. And OSWR. And if you're a Tom Clancy reader, uh, in the Cardinal of the Kremlin, he revealed the existence of OSWR and what it did. This wow. guy was really well connected. Um, and so OSWR and its predecessor called the Weapons Intelligence Nonproliferation Arm Control Center, WINPAC, W-I-N-P-A-C, that organization would be responsible uh, for looking at these type types of phenomena. Wow. And so their subject matter expert then went into the agency and just not CIA, but all the agencies, all the subject matter experts, and then they start briefing the appropriate people uh, that we're starting this working group and this is why we're starting it. Um, and so the agencies would then contribute um, other working group subject matter experts to participate to, in this study. And so they all gathered and it's at an NGA facility um, NGA is located in Springfield, Virginia, and in St. Louis, Missouri. And they want to stay out of DC. So <laughs> St. Louis, Missouri. And this is nothing classified. You can look up NGA WEST West, NGA West, and you'll see that there's a presence in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and so they gather there, let's say, and they study these forms and they pass more collection. That is now you're going to task the constellation to look for this. You're not going to filter this out as noise anymore. Don't filter it out. If you see this, it's not noise. It's not an anomaly. Collect it. And they study it. And they studied it in depth. And from there, they said, OK, now we have all of these um, agencies, you know, the big, the big agencies, uh, NSA, CIA, DIA, NRO, NGA, and all of the uh, Beltway bandits, <laughs> and you know those, uh, Lockheed Martins, Raytheons, yeah. Boeings, all up, all, and all those North folks Earth. together, and they uh, produced a report on their findings. Wow. And this report is not geared toward, oh my gosh, it's a threat. It's say, hey, here's the scientific findings that we, we have. And we don't know what's going on, but it is going on. It's a legitimate thing. So now, you know, enter the DNI. And so since the Title 50 civilian side of these agencies work for the DNI, the DNI would then brief the President of the United States, which uh, let's say it's yeah. George Bush. Um, and so decision levers are formulated by the intelligence community working group. 
I should add the, the intelligence community never ever makes policy. We do not tell the policymakers right. what policy they should pursue. We give them uh, options called decision levers. And, with, and when they pull decision, decision lever one, let's say there's a range of options they can execute with uh, an assessment of success and also an assessment of likely outcomes and most importantly, unintended outcomes. So if you do this, all these good things that happen, but oh, by the way, all these bad things might happen as well. So we give them a range. So let's say the three ranges are, um, we're gonna continue to observe, but do not provoke the phenomenon. The second one might be, uh, we're gonna continue to observe, but we wanna do something to attract the phenomenon. And the third one might be, not only are we gonna observe, but we're gonna take kinetic action against that phenomenon which is like, for all intents and purposes, let's shoot one down. Right. Well, three didn't happen. It was no intention to shoot anything down. Yeah. Two didn't happen. One was continue to collect and analyze the phenomenon, gather more intelligence. And so that's what the policymakers knew. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now we have NIDS and we have the book, um, which George Knapp's book, um, Pump for Skinwalker, uh, right. with NITS uh, sponsoring uh, this, the, the book. Now we have that. And from reading Skinwalkers of the Pentagon, you're, you're led to believe that James Lukatsky uh, found the book and was fascinated by it and said, my God, we need to like create something like OSAP going to mm -hmm. Senator Lee. Well, what that book didn't address was that before that, there was a lot of scientific studies of this phenomenon from a space-based perspective. What Lekaski did was, since he knew about the NIT study at Skinwalker Ranch, he studied the phenomenon on the ground. Okay. And so uh, that's a long explanation, but if you read, and I suggest everyone read the book, because there's some right. fascinating information in there. Uh, and I can talk about orbs without uh, any kind of uh, 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 stigma. <laughs> and you're talking about something that's right. really woo, but you know, they saw orbs. Um, on the ground and um, the documented orbs in the sky. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened from all sap wow. onward. Now, I left the government before all sap started as all sap okay. was starting. I left the government in 2009. So I did not know that all sap was even in existence. It was truly a uh, special uh, access program within the title 10 department of defense. What right. I knew about was that there've always been studies about this phenomenon. Yeah, it seems like it. But uh, what really triggered the acceleration of this study was the fact that now we had a new type of sensor data that can more in depth examine the phenomenon as to what it is, is its makeup. And so uh, that's the part that's missing that I included in my slide presentation that CIA said it's not classified. Wow, that's incredible. I just, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing all that. I feel like uh, a lot of people have been in the dark for whatever reason, as far as, you know, what's happened in all that time. And it's really kind of you to share that with us. Um, I have to ask, did, were any sort of conclusions made as far as where from or intent from uh, the study Lockheed and all the other big guys did? And that's why I refused to be read in to that program. <laughs> I had a fact of knowledge because I sent two of my engineers to NGA West and they got read into everything. Uh, but I did not. I did not want any reading. So I can't discuss that at all. I, I don't yeah. speculate. Um, <laughs> I can give you informed speculation, but I can't speculate sure. about any of that. Yeah, no, that's so okay. Okay. Um, so then... You know, in your career, have you had any experience with um, Lou El Elizondo and any of that stuff? Um, Chris Mellon? I knew about Chris Mellon because he was a policymaker. You know, he right. was the uh, I, intelligence. Um, actually, he was not the undersecretary. He was the deputy assistant, something. Or yeah. right. um, he wasn't the actual guy um, at USDI, but he was somewhat below that. Um, so, uh, CIA analysis supports the 
supports them. Right. Um, okay. And they, they get information not just from CIA, but all the intelligence agencies. DIA is their primary product producer. So as they're in the Department of Defense, so DIA provides military intelligence that they really okay. need. We provide scientific and technical intelligence, uh, not really geared towards uh, assessing the threat. Right. So that's the difference. So I knew about Chris Mel, but I didn't know about <laughs> Sando. Okay. Um, you now being in the CIA intelligence, all that, um, do you have any experience with remote viewing by chance? Um, yes, but not official. <laughs> um, remote viewing like everybody else, because I, I, uh, I heard about it, uh, listening to, uh, coast to coast AM back when Art Bell was right. The host. And so by the way, coast to coast AM was a very popular program amongst, uh, uh, my friends at CIA. Um, we listened to it religiously and we would like discuss it at lunch, you know, what, you know, what we heard on Coast to Coast AM. Um, and so I learned about remote viewing in that sense, that there was such a program. Um, and then um, I posted in a uh, discussion database that's unclassified, that can't be FOIA because it's not an official record. This is a discussion database um, in Lotus Notes by IBM. Lotus Notes was the primary software that CIA used uh, okay. to communicate everything. There were Lotus Notes applications for everything. This really dates me because <laughs> that's, <not laughs> that's uh, this was before like Facebook and Twitter and all this. You know, so we had Lotus Notes databases. One of them was called the Users Group. And we called it affectionately thugs. That's a poor choice of name. <laughs> but it's called the users group and we thug, and we just put an S at the end. And yeah. I was one of the administrators of that database. Oh. And it was just about mostly about like uh, us computer geeks getting together and trying to like, hey, did you try the latest NVIDIA card? You know, <laughs> I got like really great frame rates on this game. I mean, <laughs> Uh, we talked about everything other than intelligence work because CIA said you can use this database to exchange technical data or technology data, but you can't talk about classified stuff. Right. Well, see, this, there's the advantage there. Um, I started talking about remote viewing. And uh, so through talking about remote viewing, I got private uh, emails within CIA of people saying, yeah, I know about the remote viewing program. Yeah, we had this remote viewing program. Mm -hmm. And uh, then um, there were books written about the remote viewing program, which I read voraciously. Um, and so when Ed Dames, Major Ed Dames was a frequent guest on Coast to Coast AM and he was selling yeah. this uh, home remote viewing kit. <laughs> <laughs> and I purchased two of them, uh, the original one, did you get a was, BOGO? <laughs> which was VHS, and the other one okay. was on CDs or DVDs. Uh, okay. uh, so I purchased them. I, I, I did uh, uh, the first part of the course and just practicing. And um, there were other, uh, a friend of mine, a CIA friend of mine, also uh, had the course. And we were like practicing remote viewing together in CIA oh, during wow. our lunch breaks. Wow. Wasn't yeah. official lunch breaks. Right, right. Um, so yeah, that that was my experience with remote viewing. Now I can also add to that, and I be careful here. I sure. believe that I've actually uh, seen uh, data from remote viewing because I was given data and said, "Here's a drawing," and I said, "Okay, where's this drawing from? That's interesting." And it looks like a radar system. I don't know what this radar system is. And he said, "What? You know, the first thing you ask is an intelligence analyst." What was the source of the data and what was the method of extraction? And they said, oh, that's a very sensitive source. We can't tell you. But I mean, what do you think about this? So I did a complete analysis and submitted it. And years later, I found out what I saw in the photograph. The, the remote viewer uh, was very good at uh, actually uh, letting us know about a certain radar in, in Russia that they were working on. Wow. That is incredible. So, yeah, that was my one and only remote viewing story. That's and a pretty good one, though. <laughs> it was 90s when the program stopped. But it right. seemed like there was a, a lot of uh, backlog of these reports. And so 
Um, yeah. These reports were pulsed out to uh, subject matter experts. Mine was in uh, large Russian radars, like ballistic missile defense radars, big ones. Um, and wow. so since the remote viewing or alleged remote viewing of the diagram that I got looked like something like that, it came to me. And so that was my one and only remote viewing story, but I got confirmation from within of people who were actually in the program from the CIA side saying, yeah, we, we actually had this program. That's incredible. Yeah. And I've told you, I'm pretty deep into the FOIA reading uh, library and that whole Stargate program yeah. and everything. There's a lot of reports in there. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. Um, to kind of go backwards, I wanted to ask you something. Have, have you heard of the National Security Space Office, formerly NS, NSSA? And do you know if anything was happening with that? If it has anything to do with this? National Security Space Office? Yeah, NSSO. NSSO. I'll take that as a no. <laughs> Unless it's a part of the NRO, I would not know because the NRO okay. runs the National Security Space Program. Right, right. Uh, okay, gotcha. Understood. I think it's just an office within NRO. You have to dig out the NRO organization yeah. charts and look back at it. So okay. they, you know, the government, you know, it's like moving the deck chairs around. <laughs> yeah. Um, every time the budget is threatened, uh, they reorganize and make it look like, oh, we're doing something different. Uh, <laughs> and keep the money coming. Um, so it might be an NRO, part of the NRO. And I, I can't say for sure. I don't know. It, well, yeah, no, that's okay. I just wanted to ask, um, what, when did the intelligence groups or you uh, basically start realizing that there may be some sort of uh, paranormal or conscious connection to these orbs or just UFOs in general? That's a personal download. Uh, I, nothing from my professional experience, but this is my personal experience because I've had um, these uh, metaphysical experiences related to visitors. Um, uh, I call them people. <laughs> They're just people. They just differ from us. Yeah. Um, I had folks visiting me from elsewhere um, that pretty much, as people have said, you know, they could be shadows or they could be um, like uh, corporeal beings. I've had experiences like that all throughout my life. Yeah. And this goes more into the woo factor, but um, sure. No, that's I do that here. So, yeah. Um, now, it, it must have been kind of intense for you to uh, not currently be, you know, uh, serving. And you see all this play out on the news 2017 with the Navy videos and the big article. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure you were, had some sense of shock. Um, when you saw those videos in the story, what did you think of it? Does the, did the videos do anything for you? Did, have you seen that kind of thing before? It was it all brand new? No, I mean, it shock value was like minimal. I mean, there was no shock value whatsoever. Um, yeah, it's just that you know, uh, I'm both an experiencer and a believer. Yes, yeah. so when I saw them, it's all about time, you know, they released these things. Um, so I knew about uh, the, the the fact that um, the orbs were detected. But as far as metallic craft like that, or it could be uh, some manifestation of uh, electromagnetic energy around a metallic craft, um, it didn't shock me at all. I was just uh, happy that uh, these videos were released because I thought this was a watershed moment in the entire ufology field. Finally, you know, the government comes out and yeah. presents real data. It's quite incredible, though, how even though that's happened, um, there's enough skepticism or doubt, per se, um, to kind of keep us in the same spot. Isn't that? It's a little odd, isn't it? It is. Um, yes, it is. It is. And it depends on your worldview, where are you coming from? Right. Uh, I know that when I talk about my personal experiences with the phenomenon, and I should preface this by saying, in the government, everything the metallic craft, the light orbs, the beings, the paranormal beings, the metaphysical beings, ethereal consciousness, higher consciousness beings, everything is classified under the phenomenon with a capital P, including those disturbing aspects of the phenomenon that uh, uh, were documented in the uh, Skinwalkers of the Pentagon book. So it's all the phenomenon. So as the phenomenon, 
Um, no, I, I would say that um, uh, I wasn't shocked by it and uh, I did not see it as unusual. Um, yeah. And I lost your train of question, unfortunately. No, 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 that's okay. You answered it. Um, just a couple quick questions on, um, you know, because it's not so often I, I get to speak with someone like you. So um, excuse me if I'm asking too many questions and I don't want to come off rude or anything. Um, no, no, no. Before you ask, here's my philosophy on it. You're an American taxpayer. You already paid for my time. You paid taxes. I am enjoying the benefit of retirement uh, from the government because you paid your taxes and I was able to take my salary and set aside tax money. So um, I'm here at, uh, as a super whatever nice. Whatever you want, you know, whatever I can do for. Very uh, good. Uh, Breath of fresh air. So, yeah, go ahead and ask your question. Um, a couple of things that a lot of people talk about uh, and that are on minds of people. Um, the Princeton, you know, there's a lot of uh, back and forth as far as the data and what's happened there and people coming, mysterious people coming and taking the data bricks away. Um, and then you had mentioned also something else that we haven't heard about that may have picked up something. Um, would you mind going into that a little bit? Picked up. So first of all, the data bricks. Somebody came on the Princeton, I believe it was, and told oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Um uh I actually contacted Gary Boris, who was the fire control technician, uh the FT. He's the they're the people that operate the Aegis missile system, including the radar and the missile itself. Mm -hmm. And so he was on the uh, AN slash SPI one or spy one radar, the phase array radar. And uh I Finally got a hold of him thanks to a uh, friend of mine and uh, was able to make contact with him. And he was very open to taking questions until he saw my questions. And so one of the questions I asked was, you know, about the radar, the data, you know, and uh, particularly the uh, electromagnetic data uh, mm -hmm. that might have been collected because we, we know that uh -huh. they have the uh, the advanced technology flare data, at least that's what Tic Tac videos and the other Go Fast and Gimbal videos right. are all about. It's the IR data. And I wanted to know if the Princeton also collected electromagnetic emanations uh, from a piece of equipment called the AN slash SLQ32 or SLIC32. It is a microwave receiver uh, for the ele uh, electronic countermeasure system on board Princeton. So it can collect uh, a lot of electromagnetic emanations across a wide um, radio frequency band, band uh, bandwidth. And I wanted to know if there was any of that data. And uh, he was not forthcoming at all. Yeah. But um, we learned from the book that uh, Mr. Axelrod, uh, according to the book, and uh, correct me if someone reads the book, uh, I read it at night, uh, not recommended. Not supposed, yeah, you, you literally told me not I to do it that. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but apparently uh, Axelrod, uh, Mr. <laughs> Axelrod, uh, was one of the people who boarded the Princeton, interviewed the Navy personnel, uh, the crew members on board Princeton, and acquired the data. And so I wanted to know if there was any electromagnetic data, other than like what we see in the videos, or is there actual signals data uh, right. from there? And I, uh, instead of like asking where the data went, I told him where the data went. So yeah, uh, Mr. Axelrod may have collected it, but who else might be interested in the data? Since it was collected by this countermeasures system on board the Princeton, uh, I offered that it's the Office of Naval Research, Code 31, uh, Division 312. And the reason why I say that is because that part of the Office of Naval Research is responsible for the electronic countermeasures capabilities of the U.S. Navy. And so right. since it's their equipment that collected it, they likely have the data as well. That's right for a FOIA request. If you know where to send your FOIAs, you might be surprised right. where you get it. Yeah, that's so an agency and they say, oh, we don't know anything about this. It's because mm -hmm. they're not responsible. They're not going to volunteer. Oh. We don't have it, but look over there, and uh, you know, you might ask our sister agency. They're not going <laughs> to do that. 
And so when you ask for data from uh, an organization that's not responsible for the actual data, uh, they're going to say, we don't have it. And people think there's a cover up. Well, right. the cover up is exactly. not knowing where to go. And if you right. tailor that FOI request to where you want to work of the, with the data that you're asking for, the type of data, you might get a response. So someone yeah. out there, John Green, uh, Greenwald, please ask the ONR if they have <laughs> slip data from the Princeton uh, related to Tic Tac and all the other naval encounters that uh, we have, um, we've known about. Yeah, that, I hope he does. If not, uh, maybe I will. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so um, you might not have any thoughts on this, but uh, uh, Jeremy Corbell and company uh, released a few videos as well. Mm -hmm. Have you seen those, the, the pyramids and the, the orb that went to the water? Right. right. Um, um, yeah. Any thoughts um, on those? I, I looked at the, uh, the, the unfortunately, the uh, first of all, I'm surprised that a camera was allowed in the Combat Information Center of any U.S. Navy ship. Yeah, well, who's the they did not allow that to occur. And there is no photography inside the Combat Information Center unless it's staged. And usually you see pictures inside Combat Information Center when it's staged. Um, yeah. And they put up some bogus, uh, you know, screen display. And there's a lot of those. You can just look up CIC, right. Navy, and uh, you'll see all kinds of, of photographs. Um, but I looked at that and I looked at the uh, symbology used on the screen. Hmm. And I could not correlate the symbology on the screen with anything I know to be of the uh, Naval Tactical Data System or the follow on to the NTDS system. So I looked at that and the symbology was weird. It was not the same. Also looked at the screen and there's just way too much information on that screen. Um, it looked to be like a marine radar uh, on that screen. So yeah. I'm not gonna dismiss it outright. I don't think it's one of the uh, Navy radars. I think it's a, the, the all the ships have a Raytheon branded marine radar, the kind you can buy for your own personal boat. Um, and the symbology on it looks very much like something like that. Um, the other brand is Furuno. Furuno? Yeah, an Italian radar. It has symbology that is not consistent with Navy tactical data symbology. But, and also I listened to the banter. Sure. Um, and that doesn't sound like CIC banter I was accustomed to on board uh, my destroyers I served on. Um, yeah. It's just too much chatter there. It's a very professional kind of banter, the give and take between crew members mm -hmm. in CIC. Uh, the combat information officer is in charge and he will not allow, no self-respecting uh, CICO will allow, you know, like his crew in, in CIC to just go crazy like that. It, right. would, it would be very disciplined. I didn't hear that, but I don't dismiss it. I don't dismiss it at all. Um, so, and the other thing about radar data, um, uh, I'm gonna address why people think that these craft can't be detected by radar. These craft can be detected by radar. Yeah, I know that. We need a radar <laughs> return. Uh, the reason why that myth has occurred is because what's on the scope is not necessarily what the radar detected. The scope operator will adjust the scope so that uh, he or she can see contacts. And in the case of air traffic control radar, well, what they're seeing is the IFF contact. Uh, every plane will like broadcast, I'm a UA, United Airlines heavy, like so-and-so, so-and-so, and there'll be symbology uh, showing where it's at, where it's going, and all the course and speed information, altitude. Um, and so that type of information will be on the radar scope. Um, if you turn, make adjustments so that you get rid of noise, uh, you're not going to see uh, anything uh, that might uh, have some kind of what we call signature management that is controlling the radar cross section of, of yourself so that you can't be seen by radar. Um, right. So if they look at the raw radar data uh, that was actually return to the radar system on board the Princeton, for example, the raw radar data would not have any of the operator interventions. It would actually show what the radar has detected. And that's the information that still, I think, is probably in those uh, compartmented channels 
um, of, sure. of all sap and post all sap. They still probably have it. Um, that would be interesting to see, but I mean, it's not yeah. <laughs> anything that we as civilians can look at and say, yeah, it makes sense out of this. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot of uh, special equipment to actually see the raw radar returns and make sense of it. Yeah. Um, that's, that's very interesting because, you know, since the fifties, there's been radar pickups on this stuff and it's kind of like the same thing, creeping appearances. They disappear when the plane gets up to it. Um, or they're following it for long amounts of time. Um, but it seems like they never, the, you know, when I say they, I mean, you know, the various things that uh, are described, it seems like they never um, tried to, you know, attack or hurt, um, at least kinetically, you know, is that your experience as well, or as far as you know? As far as I know, um, that's not entirely true. If we believe okay. the uh, skinwalkers of the Pentagon, right. well, uh, apparently uh, uh, blue orbs are not good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm thinking right. blue orbs, uh, bad things will happen to your health. Um, but in terms of like, um, do they pose a, a threat? Uh, that's interesting because um, I think Captain, former US Air Force Captain Robert uh, uh, Saul, is a solace, I think. Yes. Uh, yes Michael Salas. Salas and Robert Maelstrom. mixed up. <laughs> I think it's uh, without the S and one L. Uh, um, yeah. Solace. Well, anyway, the, um, he reported that at uh, Maelstrom, we were stationed at Maelstrom as a uh, bliss missile launch officer uh, 20 miles away from uh, where the main event occurred. Uh, he reported that um, the uh, the missiles were shut down. Right. And so um, what I bring to the table is that um, when people read that, they think that the nukes were shut down. The nukes were never shut down. The missiles were rendered inoperable in terms of being able to launch. Mm -hmm. And so a certain communications module uh, was brought offline. And when you're uh, launching a Minuteman II missile, uh, from Maelstrom back in the uh, 60s, uh, you have to have a green board. Every system has to be green in order for that missile to launch. And the communication system known as the voice recording signals assembly, there are 10 of them uh, in a box because each one is associated with a certain missile. Uh, each launch, launch control center has 10 missiles to launch and each one of them went offline rendering the missile unable to launch. And that's what happened. Um, same thing happened to our, uh, uh, Robert uh, Salas um, Launch Control Center, which was like 20 miles away. He was in something called um, a Wing Oscar, and his Wing Oscar was stationed 20 miles away. Wing Echo was the mostly affected with all 10. And so these things went offline, not being able to launch, but uh, believe me, um, if the nukes were rendered inoperable, uh, the entire base would have been shut down uh, and gotcha. an investigation would occur. You know what happened the day after that incident on March 16th, 1967? Uh, well, I know other bases got visited too, like Michigan's did too yeah. or something. But you know. Something happened at Maelstrom the day after that incident. Okay, I do know. Thousands. One thousand thousand Minuteman missile was delivered to Maelstrom with great ceremony. Wow. On March the 17th, 1967, they accepted the missile with great ceremony, and it was as if nothing happened. As Interesting. If, uh, we'll talk about anything that happened. But now we have 1,000 missiles of Minuteman twos, and also uh, we had at that time 54 Titan II missiles. So the entire nuclear missile inventory was 1,054, 1,000 Miniman twos, 54 Titan twos. And in fact, wow. right here in Tucson, uh, we have the Titan II Museum uh, of one of the missile sites being preserved. Uh, so 1,000 missiles and 54 Titan twos. That's a lot of megatonnage. Yeah. Okay, so this is 67, right? And so <laughs> let's pretend nothing happened. Uh, okay, the uh, okay. <laughs> coming in. ceremony 
bring up the uh, bass band and we just have a ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> the silo, um, I believe a few months later, and I think it was in May of 67 that Maelstrom actually formally accepted the missile into the silo and it was operational. So now we have um, all of Maelstrom's missiles operational. Okay, this is 67. What happened in June of 67? Lyndon Baines Johnson, our president back then, met with his counterpart, Kusigan, who was the uh, chairman of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And they met at a place called Glassboro, New Jersey. And what LBJ proposed to Kusigan was that, hey, I think it's time that we look at our nuclear posture and uh, we need to reduce the possibility that we can get into a nuclear war because we have all these missiles. Right. Let's start serious talks about limiting the number of missiles we have. So March uh, 16th, uh, the event happened to shut down those uh, missiles so they can't launch. Uh, the next day, they accepted 1,000th missile and then put it in place in May. And then in June, our president of the United States says, I don't think we should have all these missiles. <laughs> think about that. And is that a message that was conveyed? You know, is that? Yeah, could be, yeah, it could be. Said, hey, you know, these, can, these things can be shut down. And yeah. that's something about shutting them down ourselves. You know, let's start reducing. Uh, yeah. It's like you can build this up as much as you want. Doesn't mean they're going to work. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. Salt one, Salt two. Now we're in Start, and we have salt a new two, yeah. Start. Um, and there's a whole. I mean, I could do another presentation on on uh, our strategic posture, but I mean, it's got to the point now that um, um, the Russians allow us to look at their missile data. That's the result of everything that happened. Wow. The Russians allow us to look at their missile data. When they launch a missile, up to five times per year, five data sets go to CIA, hmm. CIA That's lab, incredible. our lab. And our missiles shot from Vandenberg to the Kwajalein Atoll uh, across the Pacific. Uh, five of data sets of our missiles can go to the Russians, and they analyze our missiles to make sure that we are complying with the START Treaty also, Russians can investigate our missile sites. We investigate their missile sites in person. Um, and we have even the point. To make sure we count all the silos. Yeah. Now, all this could not have occurred <laughs> in the Cold War. Yeah, no. But think about what was revealed about shutting down our nuclear missiles. And we now know that the Russians also experienced similar types of events with their strategic rocket forces. And so maybe that's a benefit that we had from our visitors. Yeah. Saying, hey, you're doing something that's very dangerous. Don't do it. Yeah, that's what Robert says more or less. He said, I left with a clear message, which was, what are you people doing with this? Right. What are you doing with all this? Yeah. Right. Um, very, yeah, very interesting. It's, you know, it, it. there's a lot in life that happens sometimes where you don't really understand why it happened, but it turns out for the best, you know, and maybe it's one of those types of situations, mm -hmm. but, um, man, you've been great. Do you mind if the chat chat group asks you some questions sure. or anything? Yeah. Okay. I will let them ask you away. Uh, the, but I should really, I should really ask you this too. Um, because I know you're very passionate about all of this and you've had your own experiences. Um, why don't you tell us what your, con your speculative, I guess, uh, conclusions are on all this or, or what you think is happening, um, how you are looking at it and how you put these pieces together? Well, my perspective is um, don't concentrate just on the craft and the occupants, the drivers of the craft. Uh, concentrate on the message. Let's, let's meditate on the message, if you will. What are they trying to say to us? Mm -hmm. And they've appeared all throughout history. And it seems like uh, throughout history, they've intervened with humanity in certain ways. And I actually, my personal belief, I'm, I'm a Catholic under 
perpetual recovery. Perpetually recovering from being a practice. Right. Feeling guilty because you're not. <laughs> but going back uh, to the very beginning, um, it is my personal belief, and here's where the woo factor comes in, and here's where I get criticized by folks who just want to look at craft with extraterrestrial beings from Planet X, for example. True. My personal belief is that well, we're the newcomers on the planet, and there are other uh, people on the planet that have been here before uh, the, of higher consciousness, of more advanced capabilities, and um, they themselves were seated for this the same time we were. Otherwise, we would be like primates. We would be like, go to the zoo and you see bonobos, chimpanzees, and gorillas, and all of our primate friends, and realizing that the percentage of DNA between me and uh, standing, looking at them, and then me climbing up that tree um, is very small. <laughs> it's, it's like yeah. a percent and some fraction. What happened that made us us? You know, look right. at that. And so if you go back uh, from a religious context, from a Western religious context, you look at the Bible from the Abrahamic religions, and we, we uh, see that um, there was two forces, and they both let us make man in our image, right? Mm -hmm. And they yeah. made us in our image, okay? So I interpret that as um, DNA intervention. Well, that's yeah, what the Bible is a, a wonderful piece of science fiction or like science fact. And um, so you have two, you have uh, these uh, early people from advanced, an advanced civilization who themselves may have been seated or may have come from another earth coming here, seeing us primates and say, let us make them like us. And then you have one of them saying, well, let's really accelerate them really fast. Okay. Yeah. But wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not in the program, but they did it anyway. And mm -hmm. so that was a point of contention between these two. But now we think that one is good and one is evil. One is God and one is Satan. Well, suppose that what we're actually reading about in the Bible are beings from elsewhere or from here that elevated us. And there was a point of contention because some of us got elevated faster or more advanced. Well, wow. let's call them Atlanteans for lack of a better term. And maybe they were the ones that got cast out, the fallen ones. <laughs> um, and we also look at Genesis 6 and then we see that um, that, uh, you know, the sons of God or like people from the sky, <laughs> not from earth, saw yeah. the daughters of man to find them at a, a fair and uh, made it with them and created another race. So um, when I talk to uh, fundamentalist Christians about this uh, and I ask them if they believe in extraterrestrials, they absolutely just say, no, of course not. No such thing. But now I ask them, do you believe in the Bible? Of course I do. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you believe in angels? Do you believe in messengers of, messengers of God? Yes, I do. Of course. And mm -hmm. of course I do. Well, do you believe they're from Earth? No, they're from outside of Earth. And I go, yeah, see, you do believe in extraterrestrials. <laughs> and so you look at that. And so that's where I see, like, uh, where we originated and that they've always intervened to help us. Yeah. In some way, and prevent us from destroying ourselves. Yeah. And um, I, if you look at the Immaculate Conception, uh, if you read it from the uh, ufology perspective, uh, what's to say that uh, Mary herself was taken aboard, and and yeah, uh, and, and the thing hand, happened. <laughs> and Jesus, who was a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. He called upon heaven that. to make things happen, you know? You know, uh, it's funny that you say that because I've always thought and felt like because I was raised non-denominational Christian, yeah. you know, um, and I've, and you see other religions and, and everything, and they have so much in common, and there's always, I always think like, well, what can make you right and them not? <laughs> you know, how is that possible? So I, I always kind of wind up thinking like it, it all could exist. It's just these labels and things we put on it that may not be very accurate right you know yeah yeah that's that's where i see the you know, buddha and all of these great religious leaders right. um, um they may have had downloads themselves 
Sure. Uh, the prophets of old may have actually been channelers, you know. Yeah. If you look at supernatural events that have happened, like the uh, the uh, early Israelites uh, in the exile uh, mm -hmm. going um, back toward Canaan and having this cloud delivering them food <laughs> and yeah. expecting to Man, build this box so we can talk to you. And, oh, by the way, only priests can talk to us, and yet they have to right. wear the clothing because if you touch it, you're going to get zapped. And, you know, and if you look at that, um, it seems like all throughout history, humanity, there's been interventions to keep us from destroying ourselves to advance us. Yeah. Before to 1945, <laughs> what did we do in July of 1945? Right. Boom. You know, we mm -hmm. exploded the first uh, atomic bomb uh, in the desert of New Mexico. And um, so that's when the intervention really started. They, these guys finally, the kids have found the box of matches and they're lighting them. And now yeah. we really have to watch them, uh, what they do. And now they're in helping us to intervene. The fact that we're destroying this planet, and that's not good. That yeah. we destroy this planet, uh, not taking care of it. Uh, we have the capability of destroying ourselves deliberately now. Yeah, we do. Um, through ignoring uh, what we do with climate control, uh, 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 checking our climate to make sure that our climate is not out of control, uh, our use of natural resources, and also our uh, nuclear capabilities of trying to reduce that. So that's what I think is happening, that intervention that is happening in a very dramatic way now because we're at the yeah. crossroads. And also that people are having uh, experiences of higher consciousness. Well, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't discount channelers or experiencers. I myself am an experiencer. I don't discount that. And in ufology, we destroy ourselves by pinting, yeah. pinning the nuts and bolts crowd with the channel, you know, uh, I don't want that to happen because that plays yeah. into, by the way, a Not faction anywhere. government that think all of this is demonic. Mm -hmm. And so that's interesting. Kind of yeah. Tell me why you think it is. They do think it is demonic. Do you have any sort of insight on that by chance? Uh, I should for, probably get to these. Read uh, the Skinwalks of the Pentagon because obviously there's, I don't call it demonic. I just think they're strangers who do not know how to interact with us and do so in a harmful way. Right. That goes back to my philosophy of having residents who may be advanced Atlanteans that are still mm -hmm. on Earth or uh, interdimensional uh, from another Earth coming here, who, by the way, might be Saurian because on their Earth, that asteroid never destroyed the dinosaurs and they evolved wow, that's an intelligent being. We call Saurians. Uh, I think of visitors who might be from another world who have developed technology to traverse space and time, to displace space and time through maybe a portal, and also believe in strangers who uh, are not sure how to deal with us. And maybe that's what we're seeing as Skinwalker are right. these other manifestations of the phenomenon who don't quite know how to deal with us. And let me interject something very interesting. Uh, sure. I don't know if Please. you know Melinda Leslie. I, I know every yeah. If you know of her, okay. Um, and mm -hmm. she writes extensively about her experience with MILAPS, the, the military abductions. And she says something interesting uh, in her talks. And she said in her experience, she has seen military personnel with Saurian beings. And the reason why people are being taken is to question them about whether they can understand um, these advanced propulsion systems. Oh, wow. Go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you have the Saurians there, and you think of them as ETs, right? And you think of how they came here, why can't the military just talk to them? Why are they <laughs> people like us, we the people, yeah. uh, trying to find out how this magnificent piece of engineering works? This advanced propulsion system, just ask the Saurians. Why are the Saurians there? I try to contact Melinda Leslie, and I have it. She's in Sedona. And uh, yeah. I'll be visiting Sedona in January, and I hope to be able to talk to her. I well, never hoping... even ask her that. If you I'm think, hoping... uh, you know, you're being taken because you're there to uh, help uh, the government understand how to fly these things, and the Saurians are there, why can't they fly? Right. I don't know what that is. <laughs> I'm trying to go to New Mexico on my birthday in February, so maybe I'll see you. <laughs> I know, I, I'm just free flowing, just stream of consciousness. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not. No, you're doing, you're doing great. If I'm not answering your question. 
No, you are. No, I just said uh, I'm trying to go um, to the Southwest um, in February on a vacation for my birthday. So maybe I'll maybe I'll check you out there in Melinda. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, this is a good question, uh, but maybe you answered it. Do you think that anything has been reverse engineered or I'll even add in there recovered? Um, that's the question I personally do not know. And so I just got to give you speculation. Yep. Um, I do believe that Roswell happened for sure. Okay. Uh, and I do believe that this metallic craft was taken to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to T2 intelligence at the time. And reverse engineering means taking a uh, craft and trying to determine how it works and reproducing it. Um, I don't know if that's happened because I have no direct information about that. Right. I want to make that clear, but it's my personal belief that it has. There's some kind of technology transfer going on. In my presentation, I built a bridge that, uh, in fact, I uh, discussed this with Don Schmidt, and he doesn't buy it at all. Um, <laughs> but I discussed this with Don Schmidt and say, you know, uh, it's a fact that um, during, before World War II, uh, the Nazi party, the SS, had a special group to go out and find artifacts to make contact with Atlanteans because they believe that the Aryan race was a manifestation of the Atlantean race, hmm. which they described as Nordics. And they went all over the world and looking for artifacts or some evidence that Atlanteans exist. They went to Antarctica, or they hmm. went to Tibet, and they talked to the Tibetan Buddhists. And um, in my presentation, I have a photograph that I found of SS officers with Tibetan monks in Lhasa wow. in 1938. And it was all part of like finding these artifacts, finding the sphere oh. of destiny, all of that, which we see in Indiana Jones, yeah. was not fiction. I mean, there was a group like that. That's now, in 1945, um, the, after we defeated Germany militarily, um, we wanted to know, first of all, where all these scientists were, and we wanted to uh, extract any kind of uh, German technology that may have been worked on. We knew that they had a V-1 rocket, which was right. a cruise missile, and a V-2, a real ballistic missile, as far, and also a V-3 that didn't fly. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so what uh, what we did was we created an organization called the JIOA, the Joint hmm. uh, Intelligence operations activity and i have to look that up it's in my notes but it's j i o a and that was created in may of 1945 the war ended germany surrendered may 7th of 1945 yeah. and shortly thereafter j i o a was created and they went out to uh and who who did they consult um they consulted the ss officers um <laughs> and a little known fact you know who guarded the Nazi war criminals in Nuremberg? SS. We <laughs> recruited three divisions of SS from the yep. Baltic states, the 15th, 19th, and 20th SS, Waffen SS divisions. Their troops, we gave them American uniforms to say, hey, guard your former masters. And they did. And so the SS officers, the Nazi party officials who knew about this program, started providing us with archived information of what they knew. And so that was in the American hands. And they, they're the ones that recommended, hey, by the way, you might want our rocket scientists before the Russians get our get your rocket scientists. Right. And here's where they are. And so And they helped build their space program. Right. And, they did, <laughs> they did more than that. and so, you know, and this, so the first uh, rocket scientist came over in uh, the fall of 1945. Well. In January of 1946. With all this information being digested by the uh, by the U.S., uh, Truman decided, and it was advised that he should create some form of, of way to secure this information to protect it from being disclosed. So, in January 1946, he he created the National Intelligence Authority, and under that, he created an organization called the Central Intelligence Group. 
CIG. Yeah. And this was between the OSS of World War II and the CIA of 1946, uh, 1947. So in between there, there was the CIG. And the CIG was responsible for analyzing all of this information and thinking that, you know, some of that data was actually materials acquired. Who's to say that we had the only industrial base in the world? Everybody else's industrial base was bombed to smithereens. But the sure. United States industrial base was strong. We just came out of a war uh, with all of these companies building more materials. And so they were the, like the real defense contractors of the day, you know? Yeah. And so who's to say that we saw, like, my gosh, there's the Glocka. <laughs> the, that... the, the, the saucer shaped one, the uh, the Horton uh, HO229. Yes. Yeah, that's actually, I told you about this book. Um, a friend of mine, Graham, wrote it, actually. It's probably the best account of the pre-Roswell um, UFOs out there. And he, yeah, yes, he's got that in here. I was just going to show you the picture, but you know what it is. It's the Horton, yeah. Yeah. It hey, it's got all other stuff in here. Yeah. <laughs> what does that remind you of? It looks like every stealth aircraft we ever built. You know? It it yeah, it does. It sure does. Yeah. I had highly recommend this though. You'll like it. Um, so uh with that narrative, um certainly I'm, I'm sure that there were uh exploitation done. Uh and I'm gonna introduce a new term that um ufologists need to know. It's F M A E. Foreign material acquisition and exploitation. It's a real thing. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on what kind of foreign material you have. So Office of Naval Intelligence will look at anything that's Navy. And I have strange things happening on my screen now. <laughs> oh, boy. Hey, have you ever heard of the Watch Committee? No. Interesting. Not, not heard of the watch committee. So yeah, FAMAE, you know, there, there is a program to acquire foreign materials and exploit them, find out how they work and to reproduce them. And that's applicable to terrestrial weapon systems. If we get an aircraft from the Soviet Union, uh, yeah. we're going to figure out how it works. And we're gonna take it apart and figure out how it works. And we're gonna fly it. So who's to say that there was some, ex, uh, some effort uh, by the by the military side to do the mm -hmm. same. Um, oh, look at that. There's the plans for the, the Glocket. Let's see if we can build one. Um, so why is Roswell so secret? I know. To this day, it's secret. Think about this. The government will talk about orbs now all day long, and we'll talk about metallic craft, cylindrical shape. Uh, we'll talk about saucer shapes and all that. Right, they will reveal all that. It's all in that book, you know. It's been revealed. <laughs> but if you yeah. ask the government about Roswell, you know what you get? Crickets, nothing. Yeah. Silence. Why is that? And that's something that's interesting. Uh, I don't know why that is. I have speculation, but I don't know why. And I think it's because there was some Nazi intervention uh, in the uh, the craft that was brought down or crashed. I mean, what makes an advanced craft crash? Yeah. The only you know, thing I could think of is it's some sort of controlled um, like event, you know, because there's so many different things that happen. So rather than people branching out and going into these different events, let's just keep everything on Roswell by, can, you know, every few years, well, something new comes up about it. So you yeah. have this controlled experience that keeps people's attention. That's, That's the only yeah. thing I could think of. But yeah. And I, I, I just think that that I think, Again, informed speculation, and this is completely right. beyond woo to who. <laughs> woo -woo. <laughs> uh, I, I, th I personally believe that um, that we reproduce the German designs based on something they learned from whoever they interacted with. Uh, let's oh. call them Atlanteans, for the lack of a better term, and that these advanced craft were built by the U.S. and flown and flown around where there was a radar system. And I know the radar system that was in New Mexico at the time at White Sands. Um, and it's also associated with B-29s. 
which guess what? Where's that Roswell? It's this radar system on the ground. And that yeah. this radar system has something to do with uh, causing the instability in the propulsion system of this craft. Because uh, we can't bring down crap now. I mean, you can shine all the radars you want at Tic Tac and, you know, nothing yeah. happens. Um, or we, we could, what about uh, EMP? We electromagnetic right. pulse, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it, it could be any of that. I mean, there are EMP generators. I mean, you, right. you can pr produce an EMP. Um, so that's my personal speculation that uh, yeah. what happened in Roswell um, may <laughs> not be as extraterrestrial as we think, but the occupants of the craft um, may be uh, from elsewhere, maybe from Earth on another Earth, and that the Nazis actually knew about them. And the fact that we have that is why it was covered up. Otherwise, yeah. if you find a spacecraft from another world crashing in your desert, uh, the government would response would be, well, let's get the academics, let's get our engineers and scientists on it. You know, we've been more on the academic side and not on the military intelligence side of the equation. Yeah. Keeping in mind that there was a central intelligence group operating. And right. like what happened three weeks later, we created the Central Intelligence Agency mm -hmm. and we created the Department of Defense. We created the U.S. Air Force and uh, oh, wow. we created what we now call the National Security State at that point. You know, it's interesting. If you look at the um, UFO sightings of, you know, 48, 49, 50, um, they're primarily around what? Uh, Los Alamos? White Sands, uh, San Diego base or a laboratory. Um, and then, um, Wright Patterson air force base that the big clusters are right there. Yeah. So you really, yeah. Who knows? Yeah. It's a clustering of these sightings. Um, so, uh, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Um, if you did, you'd tell me though, right? Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, the beauty of being in CIA is that you get the background information and you know how to analyze things and you get bits and pieces of things. But I, uh, when you don't get read into it, you're free to express those bits and pieces in a speculative way and let the audience judge whether or not it's blowing smoke or there's some modicum of truth in there. Um, I always tell people underlying every conspiracy theory are hidden truths waiting to be discovered. Right. And so I, that's the way I approach in the entire ufology field. Have you ever heard of the Collins elite by chance? Uh, yes, I have. Um, what Do you think um, something like that still exists and is uh, opposed to a disclosure? Uh, I would say this, that I, I know that there is a group uh, in the government uh, I won't place them anywhere. I don't know if they're IC or, or Pentagon or a combination of the two, but they're highly placed individuals mm -hmm. who believe that everything in the ufology um, is a manifestation of satanic or demonic forces and that we should not be playing around with this. Uh, Interesting. My fear is that the Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book gave them ammo uh, right. Because it's all about these unusual paranormal experiences that are harmful. Now, right. being harmful does not mean demonic, but I'm sure they would interpret it as such. Right. Uh, I was disclosed this much. Um, when I sent my presentation to CIA for approval, um, mm -hmm. what they did was they looked at it from the standpoint, is there anything unclassified about it? And they did not make the final determination. They bumped it up the chain uh, up to a group in the government who deals with this entire issue um, post ASAP, ASAP. And okay. they looked at it and they said, this looks good. Uh, tell the guy that <laughs> we don't have any problem with it. And so they, they are aware of, of what I wrote in it. Yeah. And um, and I can't reveal who I had the conversation with because I can't reveal that name. I have no permission to do so. Sure. I can reveal the fact of that there was a conversation between me and an individual. 
And this individual warned me about, you will be encountering people who will oppose you because they feel that way, that what you're doing is bringing to light uh, in a positive way, things they, they feel should be looked at in a negative way. So yeah. I don't know the name of it, but Collins Lee comes up. And so, okay, well, it's calling the Collins Lee, but they are people who do, do believe that and adhere to that. So do you find that the uh, Wilson Davis notes are accurate? I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I think Jay's going to be very perturbed. <laughs> he was trying to have a... Uh, uh, it's a similar type of interview, and he was going to ask me that. Oh. You get it first. <laughs> you <pooped> it. <laughs> so let me talk about uh, that. Um, I'm going to put it in a way that um, how I know, uh, not particularly about that. Uh, again, I don't have permission from Eric W. Davis to know why I know about him. He doesn't know I know as much about him as I do. There are a lot of CIA officers who know about him, and he knows about some of those CIA officers in the context, but mm -hmm. not me. And that's all I can say. But let's let's say that uh, uh, I had I was privy to his resume. And I'll put it at that, and that's all I'm going to say. Uh, so I, I he is a trustable person. He, he is a very trustable, highly respected physicist. Right. And I know what he did for the Air Force Research Labs. Now, I'll say that. Now, having said that, I wish I can get his permission to tell the world how I know about him and the time context of when I found out about him, because it makes the discussion very interesting pre allsat Let's go from there. Now, Here's the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Admiral Wilson, right? And you think, oh, DIA guy, you know, he must know everything. But we learned from uh, the notes from Eric Davis that he seemed to have fact of knowledge that these programs existed. What he wanted was to be read into the actual program itself, all these programs, and he was denied that. And so could that be? Is that possible? Yes, it can be possible. When I looked through the uh, notes, I noticed a few names that I recognized. And these were uh, officers in the uh, Association of Former Intelligence Officers, or AFIO. Mm -hmm. Full disclosure, I'm also a member. Uh, John Alexander is a member. A lot of us so-called ex-spooks, and I use that term affectionately and not, <laughs> not in a derogative sense, a lot of us are members of this organization. Okay. Um, and he, they, he mentioned two of those individuals who are in the Las Vegas chapter of that organization. Okay. And they're the ones that uh, made it possible for Admiral Wilson and Eric Davis to meet. So that's one point of validity there. Uh, they met at an office for E, E, and G. And E mm -hmm. and G is the, uh, what I call the uh, O&M or operations and maintenance contractor. Uh, they're the ones that supply the black helicopters and fly them. Uh, they're the ones that guard the facility in Area 51 and guard all facilities like that. Um, they're the camo dudes that you hear about. They're all E, E, and G contractors. And they met in that office in Las Vegas. Right. Um, so that part is true, right? And so the information was that here's Admiral Wilson trying to get information about a program that he was not by Pentagon officials. How can that be? Well, just because you have a position and flag rank like an admiral in a position like director of DIA does not entitle you to be read into some of these special access programs because there's a law that regulates special access programs and it's Title 10, Section 119. If you look up Title mm -hmm. 10, Section 119 in the US code, you will read what governs the special access program. People say, oh, these are rogue illegal programs. Uh, I disagree with the rogue because the US law allows that type of program to exist uh, I do disagree with, I do agree that it might be illegal uh, in the sense that 
Um, it's legal in the sense that there's a law, but just because there's a law of the land does not make it constitutional. No one's ever challenged Title 10, Section 119. And that's something for Danny Sheehan to do because he's a lawyer. Um, he <laughs> argued cases in the Supreme Court, but that allows what we call carve outs in the special access programs so that the program managers can actually manage who's read in and who's not. It's right. up to them. The people that Admiral Mills Wilson met with are real people. And they're like the Undersecretary of Defense for ATL or Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Mm -hmm. ATL uh, is responsible for uh, developing all new technologies for the Department of Defense, acquiring and developing those technologies and delivering the resources to build those technologies. And that's where the logistics part comes in. And also, the uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, and I believe at the time there was another letter, uh, S, USDIS. I think it's just I now, but it used to be Intelligence and Security. And so they were there, as well as the SAP control officer was there. And that group determines who's right in. And they said, no, you know the fact of, and that's all you need to do. To, to know, to do your job, and you can't get this. Wow. And so that was the crux of the memo. And, that, yeah. and so my experience with this is, uh, and I put this in my presentation, um, the United States of America, and put this in the context of where we are with China today, post-Trump, the United States of America, since the Carter administration with the People's Republic of China has had a close and enduring relationship exchanging military information and intelligence. And here we are, the United States, trading sensitive information with the Chinese. Yeah. And we built in China, miniature versions of Pine Gap all over China. Can you explain what that is? Pine Gap is that uh, NRO facility in Alice Springs. <clears throat> it's, there are three NRO facilities that are a major for the collection of space-based intelligence. Mm -hmm. Pine Gap in Alice Springs, Australia. In England, it's Menwith Hill. Uh, I believe it's near Leeds or Yorkshire. Uh, that's something that Jay would know about. <laughs> but yeah. Menwith Hill, he would know all about Menwith Hill. It's a huge facility. And Denver, uh, in a place called, of all things, Aurora, California. Uh, Aurora, <laughs> I'm sorry, Aurora, Colorado. Wow. Uh, and so these are big facilities, uh, big golf balls, ray domes. And if you fly into the Denver International Airport and coming from the south into that, and if you are sitting on the left side, the port side of the aircraft, and you look out before you land, you'll see a base called Buckley, Buckley uh, Air Force Base. And in there, you'll see big white domes. That is the major collection facility for the United States of America. That's where all the satellite data goes. And that was in a memo uh, released by the DNI um, at the time to say, we're going to unclassify the existence of the fact of that the NRO has facilities at these three places and more. Wow. So we built something like that, uh, like Pine Gap uh, in China, smaller versions of Pine Gap. Right. And, uh, so it, here we have in China, this program. It was a controlled access program, CAP. That mm -hmm. is a CIA version of a SAP, SAP. Uh, controlled access program is just similar. You have a control officer, uh, you have security protocols related to uh, that program and who can be read in, who cannot be read in. Um, so uh, as this program, was commencing, I was one of the people that went over to China to train my counterparts in the People's Liberation Army. Think of it, a wow. CIA officer training Chinese intelligence officers and how to use equipment that we built for them. Yeah. State of the art. <laughs> we uh, couldn't imagine that considering uh, the times now, that's for sure. Yeah. And so I'm going with this is that where this program is extremely sensitive. Um, further along in the program, uh, I became the guy stuck with the bigot list. 
Essentially, I became the cap control officer and the office that ran this program uh, said, hey, you're it. <laughs> and here it is. Here's a bigot list. And so, oh, OK. So I was in this program for a long time. And so I looked through the bigot list. And, oh, my gosh. Oh, president, president. Yeah. Secretary of State, Defense Secretary. Da, 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 da. Uh, Dernza, uh, D-I-R-N-S-A. Dernza is what we call the director of national, uh, national security agency. And I thought, OK, there's some NSA guys, yeah, yeah, CIA guys, contractors. OK, guess who I didn't see? Director of DIA. <laughs> Director of DIA gets no love. I mean, he gets <laughs> right I don't know if it, at that level, these are the program. These are the people who actually knew about the program at a very high position in the government. And those lower and the lower paid rates like myself who actually travel for the program to execute the program. And it was a bigot list. And a director of DIA, I don't recall any DIA officers in there. In fact, I would challenge James Lakatsky if he knew about the fact that he's a ballistic missile analyst. Guess what? You didn't get all the data. <laughs> yeah. DIA good got point. Most, a lot of good, good data from the ground. Um, wow. And you got the uh, other kinds of data from the space. But we got really good data because we were right there on the border uh, looking into where the uh, Russian missiles uh, impacted and we collected all their data. And so that fact was a one time extremely tightly controlled cap. And the DIA director was not on it. So that's why I think, you know, yeah, sure, the DIA director might not be in this other program about the exploitation of crap. Right. Yeah, that makes complete so, sense. Yeah. Actually. And uh, that, that's really, I call it going to the edge of what CIA will allow me to say. But right. I referenced that slide with everything I could find in open source. Okay. Um, You're amazing. A bit more about that. <laughs> One of the sensors, uh, well, I don't know if I can talk about the sensor. Yeah, I can. <laughs> uh, so there was this uh, phenomenon uh, known as the uh, Dome of Light phenomenon. Oh. Okay. And uh, when the Russians would launch a, a certain class of missile, um, all of a sudden they were surrounded by domes of light. <laughs> Of light orbs, and yeah. every time they launch this missile, um, here comes these orbs. Wow. Um, and so we knew about these orbs, and so uh, you can imagine if uh, these missiles, and I will name the missile, is the SS-20. Uh, NATO calls it Sable. The Russians call it the RSD-10. If you want to see one, go to the Air and Space Museum in Washington D.C. And there's one right there that you can see. Uh, it's an intermediate range ballistic missile that through treaty uh, was eliminated from the Russian inventory. And we took our Pershing missiles out of Europe in response as a counter, as a, a, a counterpart. And so that missile uh, had these domes of light. And so you betcha we, we would be interested in that and that we would like brief the Chinese on why we put this special sensor to look at these domes of light. Wow. And that's what I can say about that. <laughs> uh, and guess what? In China, there's a UFO society. Civilian UFOs. Do you actually believe that the Communist Party of China will allow any civilian activity like that unless the Chinese yeah, Communist Party true. approved of it and knew about it? That's so there is true. a UFO society that met. Uh, I don't know if they're still in existence, but the timing is really interesting because um, they were created um, about the time that the CIA showed up um, yeah. on China's doorstep inside. And oh. it, so, you know, we, we told them, yeah, I think we told them about Dome of Light. And now they have a task force. Pardon me? Now they have a, a task force, apparently. Hmm. Their own UAP task force. But I wonder if that kind of coincides with when our relationship tumbled <laughs> with them. You know, and yeah, it's a bag of worms now, unfortunately, but hopefully it gets better. Uh, what do you foresee in the future with this disclosure? I think, you know, to be quite honest with you, um, you just laid down. I know you said a lot of it's unclassified and you get all of it or and you got permission, but um, you just laid down a lot of disclosure for people uh, right now. Yeah. Um, so I'm very appreciative of that. Yeah. Um, what what do you what do you see happens from here or or going forward um sure yeah. um 
Well, first of all, let me address the disclosure issue. Um, um, what I bring to the table and what intelligence officers who are retired can bring to the table is what I just described. And they're very reluctant to come forward because when we talk about this, if we don't fit into some uh, worldview of what is going on, uh, we're called disinformation agents. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to be uh, denigrated in that manner. And yeah, so folks do not want to come out to say, I don't want to be called this. I know this is what I know. I don't know everything. If they ask me what I don't know, I have to say I don't know. But when I say that, people think I'm holding withholding information, but I really don't yeah. know. So right. these people aren't going to come out. And so me coming out like this, um, I'm hoping to encourage other folks, particularly uh, my NGA colleagues, who know a lot more about what's going on up there, <laughs> uh, to come out and say, hey, you know, we can talk about this. Uh, so going from there, uh, disclosure is something to me is a top down from the government to we the people. And I think that's going to be dribs and drabs. Um, yeah. They're not going to tell you about anything that we're working on based on any technology we may have recovered. Right. I don't think that's going to happen. Do you uh, think they know anything more than, you know, we know as far as intent and where from? Uh, I, it's my speculation that they do. Yeah. I think they do know. Um, you would agree we deserve to have that answer, right? I, I think we can handle it. You know, remember yeah. that uh, movie, uh, uh, A Few Good Men, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't handle it. You can't. We can handle <laughs> yeah. the truth. Mm -hmm. I think we can handle the truth. And in fact, more of the truth is out there. So yeah. instead of like a top-down disclosure from the government to we the people, uh, what you're doing, Sean, and what everyone else is doing, uh, having these... Uh, uh, programs to let people uh, understand what's going on, to have uh, guests on uh, to explain what they think what's going on. To me, that is citizen science, and that's from we the people on up. Right. And so where this is going is now for the first time, I checked the legislation and it's good. The uh, House Permanent, no, the House Armed Services Committee and the National Defense Authorization Act for the next fiscal year 2022 has a provision in it to establish a permanent UAP office within the Department of Defense, permanent. And that yeah. means it's gonna get funded. It's not like all SAP needs to go find funding and oh, we can't get funding, we have to shut it down after two years. This is permanent. And if you read what it's in the legislation, I'm very encouraged to that there's international cooperation that's mandated by the legislation the united states government will sure. share what it knows with other countries and encourage other countries to share what they know with us well, um, to me what it says is they damn well are sure that it's not theirs or ours or they yeah, wouldn't be doing exactly. that <laughs> and uh, to address uh, the harmful effects there's also a provision in there that the government should look at the physical and psychological effects of encountering a UAP. So that addresses all of the uh, health issues that people have experienced uh, and that was recounted in the uh, recent Skinwalkers Ranch book. That people, some people have experienced uh, <clears throat> this in a way that wasn't good for their health or some yeah. people seen it and having other people uh, criticize them may have suffered some kind of psychological effect of you know, being criticized for this, oh, you're crazy, you know, from their family or friends. So now we're looking at that officially. And so I'm encouraged that, at least from the government side, um, this is going to be front and center. And now, because it's going to be the law of the land, 180, not one time 180 days, but 180 days all the time, twice per year, a report from the Department of Defense. On the, that's Title 10. Remember, Title 10 is the Department of Defense. Yep. Title 50 is the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, the uh, Intelligence Authorization Act for FY 2022. Um, they have an even stronger language, a 90 day, every 90 days. Imagine um, that's quarterly. Imagine having quarterly reports four times a year. And they also stipulated, hey, we don't care about 2004 and onward. We already know about that. Go back 
before yeah. 2004. Interesting. Go to those files and release them. Yeah. Wow. And uh, we want briefings. We want hearings. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping that these hearings, um, both in the House and Senate counterparts for the intelligence committees there, and also the Senate and uh, House counterparts for the Armed Services Committee, will hold public hearings so that they yeah. can remove some of the st stigma about discussing this. That uh, so uh, scientists like Neil deGrasse Tyson <laughs> will have that. You know, he thinks that we're all like crazy. You know, like, oh no. no yeah, I know. Impossible. It's so you hard. You're not a physicist. You don't understand. This is impossible. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, he needs to understand, you know, that this is a real thing. Yeah, whether uh, he has an ego or not. This is what happened uh, yeah. before. That now I can, a candidate uh, running for office uh, in my part of Arizona, now I can say, uh, Mr. or Ms. Candidate, uh, what do you think about UAPs? And it's not like a crazy question because I'm going to say, as you know, uh, there's now a UAP office in the Department of Defense. In your position as a policymaker in Congress, what is your feeling about UAPs? What is what is going to be your policy about UAP disclosure, for example? And now I can ask that, and and people in the media, we the citizens, should be asking that of our of our representatives now that there's a UAP office. Established. And that's what I think is going forward. I think in our lifetimes, I think we're we're going to get some level of understanding of what's going on. And the uh, recent uh, skinwalkers of the Pentagon book went a long, long way of yeah. addressing. So, um, can you somewhat vouch for the authenticity of it? As far as you can tell, of course, from reading it, it all seems up to snuff for the most. I part. looked at the uh, security protocols in place. I looked at the reporting requirements. The way it was constructed, the budget, I know a lot about how budgets are constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say yes, indeed. That is very authentic. I, I would totally, totally place uh, a high degree of validation on that piece of work. That's beautiful to hear. You have done this community uh, such good today. Um, I guess at this point, uh, we're about to hit the two-hour mark. I'm going to pass it to you. you you know, so to speak, have the floor. You can say absolutely anything you want about anything you want, um, whether it's a, you know, message to UFO Twitter or, you know, something about yourself. That's up to you. Well, I'm, I'm pretty much exhausted right now. Uh, <laughs> that's you okay. Know, you could say. Yeah, um, I appreciate I, it. I, I will. I will say this. Um, I will be at Starworks USA. Uh, that will be held in. Uh, in uh, Nevada, in uh, Laughlin, Nevada, at the, uh, I forget the name of the hotel now, um, but I'll be there. It's sponsored by uh, Paula Harris and Jacques Vallée. Oh. So I'll be there not presenting, but I'll just be a member of the audience. Like I used it? to be uh, in the 90s when I used to go to UFO conferences. <laughs> uh, I, I've actually met Paula Harris, but she didn't know that because it was mostly a meet and greet. Uh, Stephen Bassett, uh, I don't think he remembers ah. me, but um, in 2004 at X Conference, I was one of his uh, angel sponsors. I contributed a, a chunk of money oh, wow. to having that conference held. He's a great friend of show. Oh, great. I'm glad because mm -hmm. he, he's very knowledgeable how Washington works, probably the most knowledgeable about how Washington works or doesn't work. Yeah. And uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to being at the Star Wars USA. Uh, conference, and um, also uh, I'm also a member of EXO Metaverse, uh, okay. which is a group in Sedona, Arizona. Uh, it is uh, sponsored by Zenka Carroll in Sedona, and they meet periodically, several times a month, actually, like a few times a month. And uh, you'll see me there in the Zoom window somewhere. <laughs> and uh, so I'm there as well. And uh, yeah. I also would like to reveal that um, I have a light worker that's wonderful, uh, that if you want to get into a meditative practice yourself or your audience out here, uh, I encourage you to visit uh, glennyounger.com. That's Glenn, G-L-E-N-N, two N's, uh, Y-O-U-N-G-E-R, glennyounger.com. And she has a site, Divine Light Vibrations. Uh, she's the one that 
helped me bridge the world between physics and metaphysics because I came from the physics side of right. UAP experience and she came from the metaphysics side and we kind of met in the middle and we informed each other of our various worldviews uh, from there and she uh, really taught me how to meditate effectively. Um, she's on YouTube as well. Um, you can okay. look her up and she has a, uh, a meditation protocol that she uses it's about nine minutes. And that's what I use uh, for my personal life. And it really works well. Um, but other than that, I really, you know, if people contact you and have questions, I'd be happy to follow up with you. Yeah, of course. Questions they may have. Um, I'll be, you'll see more of me, I think, I, in various I, types I, of calls uh, like this. So. I think, yeah, I think you're going to probably uh, be overwhelmed uh, after this, not too far after, of people wanting to speak with you about this stuff. So, um you know, I, you know, I told you when I messaged you that you seem like a good guy and you seem like an even better guy after this. Um, you just seem very honest and you live with integrity. And I think that's very important. And you can see that uh, in you when you discuss this and how you answer questions and just how transparent you are. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people have been waiting for that and I'm glad you arrived. So, and I'm, so grateful that that we did this i feel lucky so thanks awesome, you, Sean. thanks for having me yeah my pleasure so with that being said <laughs> we'll do another two hours another time <laughs> yeah all right john you take care i appreciate it thank you all right bye all right guys uh i appreciate your time thanks for hanging out with us be good we'll see you monday Watch more podcast clips now on our YouTube channel. Go to Livewire Podcast Clips and watch more great podcast videos just like this one.